Welcome to lecture 31a. Uh, in this lecture, we want to basically try to formulate the divergence and Stokes theorems, uh, but basically find out what they look like if we're dealing with problems in which we have two dimensions. Uh, these will be basically called Green's flux theorem and Green's circulation theorem, respectively. So the material for this uh, lecture comes from reading assignment four, sections 4.1.2 and 4.2.2. The objectives of this lecture is to illustrate how Green's flux and circulation theorems can be derived from the direct divergence theorem and Stokes theorem, respectively. And the particular concepts and visualization skills will be, in fact, to apply the divergence theorem to an infinitesimally thin box uh, and also to apply Stokes' theorem to an infinitesimally thin box. Now, the approach that's being taken in this lecture is quite different than the approach taken in textbooks where they introduce Green's theorem first. But in fact, I find it's easier to start with divergence and Stokes' theorems because it's sort of an almost effortless to basically reduce things from 3D to 2D, but it's much more complicated to invoke 3D if you're dealing with a 2D problem. The textbook basically approaches things from 2D and moves to 3D, whereas I basically, in this uh, um, uh, course, have basically started with 3D and then moved towards 2D. All right, the next slide is, as usual, it's just a summary of the uh, slides to follow. This is a relatively short lecture, so fair, effectively there are only uh, two items to, uh, to be considered. So we'll just move on. All right, so the next step basically is to prove Green's flux theorem starting with the divergence theorem. Um, we can also call Green's flux theorem nothing more than a 2D version of the divergence theorem. <clears throat> so what we're trying to prove is that in fact, if you take a um, closed contour integral of a, a 2D vector field at a normal to the contour, that's dot product, integrate around the closed contour, that's equivalent to this expression here involving partial derivatives, integrated over the area that's bounded by this closed contour here. So that's basically what we set out to prove. F2D, which is the 2D vector field, has basically an X and a Y component, which are our fun only functions of X and Y. But in order to apply the divergence theorem, we need to sort of set this problem up as if it were a 3D problem. And so <clears throat> this face that you see here is a flat surface in this direction. It's curved. Uh, it has a lower uh, level here of minus delta Z over two and an upper level of delta Z over two. And we let delta Z go to zero so that these two things, base two surfaces, bottom and top, squish down and essentially sit on the plane. So that's more or less what we have. And so this is a closed surface that bounds a volume. And we have three discrete surfaces, top surface, bottom surface, side surface, which I call a transverse surface. And so if we take the uh, uh, divergence theorem and compute the, uh, the flux, which is integrating f dot ds over the closed surface, it's equivalent to the flux from this surface, the flux from the bottom surface, and the flux from the transverse surface. So these are the three. And that's equivalent to, on the right-hand side of the divergence theorem, it's taking the divergence of the vector field and integrating it over the volume. And the volume basically would be the area of the region, and the height being from delta z over 2 and minus delta z over 2. So that's more or less our starting point. And the vector field, basically, we start off by assuming that it's 3D, but that the field only has a uh, component in the transverse direction that is in the xy plane and therefore no z component. All right, so when we do the calculation of flux, we realize very quickly that two things. One is this area and the bottom area, <coughs> they're related to each other and that one is pointing in the opposite direction. So ds bottom is minus ds top. So that much we do know. Um, also that the field, given that it's only parallel to the xy plane, that means it's perpendicular to the norm to this bottom top surface and the bottom surface. And therefore, the contribution of this term and this term is zero because of orthogonality. So as a result, we can essentially say that the 
the final result would be that there's only one surface that makes a contribution to the closed surface interval, and that is the transverse component. And on the right-hand side, basically, we just have the term divergence integrated over the volume, and uh, the volume being the region, and basically the height, which is between delta z over 2 and minus delta z over 2. Also, just recall that all these vectors must be pointing outwards because the convention of the divergence theorem is that all surface area vectors should be pointing outwards. Okay, so next thing to do is, <coughs> is to do the mechanics. So we need to parameterize the vertical surface, which is ds tran. So I just arbitrarily, let's say, x is x of theta, y equals y of theta, and z is equal to z. I mean, we start that way and then basically work towards 2D. And theta is from 0 to 2 pi. So this more or less would be a position vector, which would basically map out the transverse surface area. And Z will range between minus delta Z over 2 and positive delta Z over 2. So in this case, uh, we're going to compute, first of all, T theta, TZ, and then T theta cross TZ. And then we just have to make sure that the differential surface area is pointing outwards in order to agree with the divergence theorem, theorem's convention. The, the, the differential area vector should always be pointing outwards from the surface. All right, t theta would be just taking the derivative of the position vector with respect to theta. Tz is um, taking a partial derivative with respect to z. And t theta cross tz is basically setting this up as rows and taking the determinant. First row is basically the unit vectors. Second row is the dx partial with respect to theta, and the third row is dx with respect to z. If you do this, you'll end up with this expression that you see here. And the differential surface area, then, is just t theta cross tz, d theta dz. Again, we just sort of keep things compact. I'm just letting dx d theta equals x prime theta, dy by d theta equals y prime theta, and dz theta equals 0. And turns out that this actually is pointing outwards from the surface. Okay, you can confirm that. So effectively, we do not have to multiply by negative 1 because the direction is already the correct one. All right, so then making the substitution for t theta cross tz from the above, all right, we have the information here. Uh, so t theta cross dz is this term, which is the term that fits in here. Then we can write, write out that ds transverse, differential surface area, is t theta cross tz, d theta dz. And this is the term, d theta dz. But we can basically, and then write this term here is just n transient ds tra. All right, and the unit vector, this would be the unit vector is pointing normal to the transverse surface, would be this, and dsra would take on this form here. All right, so just a, a note here that the vector tangent to the contour on the xy plane is x prime theta, y prime theta, zero. I mean, this is, if you took the derivative of these, that would be basically giving you the tangent vector. And also, this is oriented in the counterclockwise direction. So if you just want to confirm that, in fact, what we've chosen here, that is, this vector here, is the correct one representing the normal to the contour, then if you take the dot product between this vector and this vector, it should be equal zero. And yes, it is. And therefore, this is orthogonal to the contour, and it turns out it points outwards. All right. So more or less, we have consistency, and so effectively, the problem has been formulated correctly. All right, so now we just go about make substitutions. And so here we start with a three-dimensional representation. Here I've written it out in full. And then I realize that if I take a dot product between two vectors, where the z component in both vectors is 0, means I can simplify this as being a 2D vector, dot product with another 2D vector, essentially the same answer. And so I make the definition here that this f2d is more or less the zero component removed, and y theta minus x theta is basically just going to represent <clears throat> the component uh, with the zero component removed as well. So this is the normal to the contour. That's a unit vector normal to the contour. And then this, this ds basically is just the uh, n2d times ds would essentially be what we see here as being y prime theta minus x prime theta d theta, and then the dz is a hangover. <clears throat>
uh, from, the, from the previous result. All right, so that means this here can then in compact form just be represented this, in this form. And on this side, which is the right-hand side, we can also do the same thing here because there is no z component f. That means we could just write that as the divergence of the two-dimensional vector field dx, y, dz. Okay, so we'll notice that f2d is not a function of z, therefore integrating over z on the left-hand side of the divergence theorem and right-hand side of the divergence theorem gives a multiplying factor of delta z for both integrals. So there's a contribution of delta z here and a contribution of delta z here. So that means that they have the set delta z on both sides, so we can divide through by delta z, and as a result, we now end up with the expression that's shown here. So we have this is equal to this, but if you then now apply the divergence to the 2D vector field, you end up with this expression here. And so we end up with a final relationship that looks like this, and we, this is referred to as Green's flux theorem. So we've just basically proved Green's flux theorem. All right, so now let's look at Green's circulation theorem, which is nothing more than the 2D equivalent of Stokes' theorem. And this basically is Green's circulation theorem. So in this case, again, we start by defining an F2D field as being <clears throat> having only two components, and the functions are only a function of x and y. In this case, it's just a contour. It's lying in the xy plane that we're using. And we impose, impose specific conditions. We're still treating this as if it's a 3D problem, but the contour itself basically lies in the xy plane. All right, so let's look at the proof. Again, we start with f of this form and apply Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem basically says that there's a relationship between a closed contour integration and the curl of the vector field dot product with the differential surface area integrated over the surface that's bounded by this contour. And so here I've written out what that D surface should be. In this case, because it's planar, it means the vector is pointing in the z-hat direction. And so n1 ds would be just 0, 0, 1 dx dy. And so this is in compact form, 0, 0, 1 dA. If I take the curl of the vector field, then I'll end up with dgx minus dfy, and it'll be pointing in the z-hat direction, which means 0, 0, 1. Okay, so this is the resultant of having taken the curl of the vector field f. All right, so let's move on. Let R, X, Y, Z be the position vector, where we basically parameterize it in terms of a theta, angle theta. <clears throat> so you have basically X of theta, Y theta zero, and we're going once around the contour, so that means we're going from theta zero to theta equals two pi. The tangent vector would be just to take the derivative with respect to parameterization variable, which would be d theta. So X prime theta is dx by theta, Y prime theta is dy by d theta, and zero. The unit tangent vector would therefore be x prime y prime zero divided by the magnitude, which is x prime squared plus y prime squared square root. And ds would just be the magnitude of r prime d theta, which would be this expression that you see here. So this basically lies on the xy plane, as we stated earlier. Therefore, it can be further simplified. You can represent this as 2D vector field, this zero doesn't play a role, so we'll just call this 2D, ds, x prime theta, y prime theta, d theta. So the unit vector in this case would just be the same as this, except no zero component for the z, divided by the square root of x prime theta squared plus y prime theta squared. All right, so now what we do is we're going to apply Stokes' theorem, left-hand side, and then the right-hand side. For the left-hand side, we're just yeah, basically substituting for f and substituting for ds, and here are the expressions. But you can see that the z component in both cases is zero. So if you take the dot product of these two, that's equivalent to taking the dot product between two vectors which only have two components, fg and x prime theta, y prime theta, d theta. So these two are equivalent. But f of g is f2d, and x prime theta, y prime theta is 2d d ds. Okay, so this is now simplifying the left-hand side for the two-dimensional case. For the right-hand side, we have the curl of the vector field, which was this expression that you see here, and ds was this expression. So we take the dot product, and so after having taken the dot product, this basically just gives you 1, and you're left with dgx minus dfy dA. So if we equate left-hand side and right-hand side, we now end up with this expression, which is actually what we sought out to prove in the first place, 
and this is what we refer to as Green's Circulation Theorem. Well, that concludes Lecture 31A. Thank you for listening.